many proposed mechanisms of the cardiomyopathy which we see in Friedrich ataxia, and those include iron accumulation, lack of functional iron sulfur clusters, mitochondrial respiratory chain dysfunction, oxidative stress, inflammation, and then of course fibrosis. Several classification schemes have been proposed for the cardiomyopathy in FA, but the underlying pathophysiology and the course of progression in the human FA heart is really not well understood. All of the processes that I described above are more likely to be diffuse in nature rather than regional, uh, meaning it, where some disease processes affect the heart in certain segments, um, the process that's underlying the cardiomyopathy in FA is likely a diffuse process. And so it'd be nice to have measures which reflect that diffuse um, disease. Subjects with Friedrich ataxia almost always have an abnormal EKG, and they will frequently have left ventricular wall thickness that is increased above normal. Therefore, we label them with a phenotype of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, although this is different uh, than the autosomal dominant capital H hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which has been uh, better described in terms of the underlying pathophysiology. Subject with Friedrichs can also develop a dilated cardiomyopathy, and in the few case reports that have tracked folks with cardiomyopathy and FA, it seems like they progress from a hypertrophic phenotype uh, eventually to a dilated phenotype. The complications of the heart involvement in FA can include heart failure, arrhythmias at first atrial um, primarily, but we also um, unfortunately see premature death due to progressive heart failure or ventricular arrhythmias near the end. Now, the pattern of left ventricular involvement in Friedrichs um, can be left ventricular hypertrophy as reflected by an increased left ventricular mass, but we also sometimes see an increased relative wall thickness that does not have to be um, accompanied by an increased overall left ventricular mass. So this increased relative wall thickness is reflected by an increase in the wall thickness as, as, um, as compared by ratio to the diameter of the ventricular cavity. Eventually, we also may see an increase in the left ventricular size and a, a reduction in the left ventricular contraction. That's the dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype. Now, the ultrastructural changes in the heart wall which accompany this increase in wall thickness and mass or relative wall thickness likely contribute to, to subsequent dilation and dysfunction, but, but how that happens is not known. We do have some limited biopsy and unfortunately autopsy data which shows a loss of cardiomyocytes and an increase in the interstitial tissue. Cardiac MRI as compared to echocardiography can give a more accurate assessment of both the volumes and the mass as well as ejection fraction. Um, and this is a technique which can detect subtler abnormalities and changes over time. There is a, a technique called late gadolinium enhancement which in, involves contrast administration which can show localized evidence of scarring or fibrosis. And this has been shown to be a useful parameter in autosomal dominant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well as dilated cardiomyopathies with respect to predicting prognosis and predicting uh, ventricular arrhythmia burden. There are now newer techniques in cardiac MRI which can provide information about the myocardium and we'll talk specifically about this technique called T1 mapping. Now, I was not so sophisticated as to be able to give you moving pictures today. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't transmit them, sorry. But this was supposed to be a moving picture to show you how beautifully a cardiac MRI can show you cardiac function um, in various different views of the heart. So, oh, sorry. Over here we have a long axis view of the heart, and over here we have various short axis slices of the heart. And if I could make the picture move for you, you'd see the heart pumping. And that's how we would calculate uh, the, the ejection fraction. Now, this is an example of a hypertrophied heart. You can see here that the septum is bulging. Uh, and then here you have concentric hypertrophy in the short axis view. Now, by late gadolinium enhancement, you can also see regional fibrosis visually. You can see this white stripe here and over here nicely marked by the arrows also. Um, and that's a, a regional evidence of fibrosis using late gadolinium enhancement. Cardiac MRI has been specific, specifically explored in several Friedrich studies. Back in 1997, Myers Group looked at cardiac MRI uh, as compared to echocardiography and, and showed that MRI was um, able to detect septal hypertrophy and increased left ventricular mass index more often than echocardiography. 
Cardiac MRI was also used in the pediatric NIH adenum study. Um, at a national meeting, they did present that uh, late gadolinium enhancement was present in more than half of the patients. A high left ventricular mass index was in, uh, seen in more than a quarter of the patient, and they also saw systolic dysfunction in about a fifth of their patients. Subar Raman's group back in 2011 showed that adult FA patients do have low myocardial perfusion indices, as shown by adenosine stress imaging, and also as predicted by metabolic syndrome parameters. And more recently, Dr. Mehta's group showed, again, about half of patients with verdic ataxia in their cohort had evidence of late gadolinium enhancement. They looked at a, a, a particular blood marker, P1CP, um, and higher levels of P1CP predicted baseline abnormal left ventricular remodeling parameters and subsequent dilation, but these uh, levels did not predict late gadolinium enhancement, so that was their surrogate for uh, fibrosis, nor did they predict cardiac events. So back to T1 mapping. This has been proposed as a non-invasive alternative to myocardial biopsies to better characterize the myocardial tissue because T1 values um, may, uh, um, changes in T1 values may reflect the underlying processes of either edema or fibrosis. It's very attractive because it's the quantitative output that you can obtain uh, and you can follow longitudinally and also as a, a quantitatively follow as a marker in clinical trials. So a pixel-wise T1 map can be created whereby an estimate of the T1 is encoded in the intensity of each pixel and then um, uh, sum, summed and averaged throughout the heart. T1 values can be assigned colors if you want to create a visual uh, map of the T1. Uh, and then these T1 maps actually quantify the relaxation time in tissue and blood pools. You can detect small variations within the heart muscle, both before and after contrast administration. Again, you can quantify diffuse myocardial fibrosis using this technique because it doesn't rely on contrasting signal intensity, uh, as does late gadolinium enhancement. Some of the variables that we look at when using T1 mapping include the partition coefficient, which is a ratio uh, looking at myocardial to blood pool post-contrast T1 values, and then, of course, the extracellular volume, which is the inverse of those T1 values corrected for the hematocrit. So in effect, the extracellular volume or the ECV quantifies the relative expansion of the extracellular matrix as a result of diffuse reactive fibrosis in, in multiple cardiac pathologies. And this here is, I put this in here, it's a nice review by Dr. Taylor uh, last year, um, showing that there are different patterns of, of T1 variables. Uh, the black dashed line is, uh, is a normal myocardium as compared to the uh, fibrotic heart shown in blue, and then also a, a heart that's pre um, predominantly edematous uh, also shows a different slope and pattern of native and post-contrast T1 measurements. And here's just an example of a, a visual mapping of T1. Now, in normal folks, um, women have higher native T1 times, partition coefficients, and extracellular volume fractions than men, but lower post-contrast T1 times. And older age is associated with higher partition coefficients, native T1 times, and extracellular volume fractions, especially in men. So this, we wanted to make sure we took this into account, age, uh, sex, and then of course in our analysis also GA triplet repeat length. Uh, it presented here uh, are some of the normal values and then uh, some of the, the uh, values that we see in other disease processes such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, but normals for Friedrich ataxia have not yet been shown. And then finally, in terms of background, cardiac MRI is really being increasingly utilized in many neuromuscular conditions that can affect the heart. Uh, recently, the American Heart Association put out a scientific statement on the management of cardiac involvement associated with neuromuscular diseases and gave a class 2A recommendation with a level of evidence of B for utilizing cardiac MRI in the Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy population, particularly for those who have poor acoustic windows, uh, so in, for those in whom echocardiographic, echocardiographic measurements are not as uh, reliable, and also for the assessment of myocardial fibrosis. They specifically addressed Friedrich ataxia in the statement and said that although recent data implicate replacement fibrosis in the pathophysiology of cardiac involvement in FA, the utility of cardiac MRI to detect fibrosis and its distribution in FA has not yet been established. So we took that on as a challenge uh, and, a, and a directive in our, in our project. So we specifically here wanted to investigate the possibility of a role for T1 mapping in the clinical management and also in the research development of Friedrich ataxia interventions. 
Uh, we looked at the relationships between GAA triplet repeat length and T1 mapping variables, and also took a look at the relationship between those variables uh, with T1 and also other structural left ventricular variables as measured by cardiac MRI. We had both adults and children with Friedrichs uh, who did not have contraindications to MRI, the most prominent of which would be the um, presence of a pacemaker-dependent or ICD-dependent patient. We recruited from two sites around the world. So um, there were patients from Melbourne and also patients from Philadelphia enrolled in the study. And we put them through a standardized cardiac MRI protocol on a 1.5 Tesla Siemens machine. So we chose 1.5 because this is the type of machine that many centers have available to them. Uh, and we looked at left ventricular end diastolic volume, left ventricular mass, the left ventricular mass to volume ratio, as well as the left ventricular ejection fraction as our structural parameters. We also measured T1 mapping parameters, including na native T1 time, post-gadolinium T1 time, partition coefficient, and for those in whom we had a, an accurate hematocrit, also the extracellular volume fraction calculation. We performed multivariate analysis with adjustment for age, sex, and GA triplet repeat length, and also started looking at interactions with study site and also structural parameters. So I'm sorry, I didn't update this slide. We had um, the analysis that I'm going to present actually includes data from 85, not 83 subjects, including about half male, half female, and 24 children um, under the age of 18. The mean age in our cohort was about 24 years of age, uh, and the mean age of onset was about 12. Mean, mean disease duration at the time of the scan was about 13 years of age, and the mean GA triplet repeat length was uh, 672. Uh, the GA triplet repeat length and, uh, was uh, significantly longer, and, and um, age of onset was significantly lower in the CHOP cohort as compared with the Melbourne cohort. Five subjects um, had a left ventricular ejection fraction, at least by cardiac MRI, that was um, abnormal or less than 55%. We had about uh, a fifth of the subjects uh, showing a an increased left ventricular mass index when corrected for sex and age, and about half of the subjects had an increased left ventricular mass ratio greater than 1.2. So uh, a left ventricular mass um, in, in adults with a normal ejection fraction was predicted by age, sex, and GA triplet repeat length. Uh, and then when we looked at left ventricular mass ratio, again, in those adults with a normal ejection fraction, this was also predicted by genetic severity or g longer GA triplet repeat length. The left ventricular mass ratio in our overall cohort of both adults and children was relatively high, 1.26 uh, in adults and 1.35 in children. Now in the overall cohort, um, you'll see that GA triple repeat length did uh, predict native T1 time, partition coefficient, and extracellular volume fraction. Um, it did not um, statistically significantly pr predict um, post-gadolinium T1 time. Now, when we pulled out specifically those adults with a normal ejection fraction, GA triplet repeat length and sex uh, both predicted their native T1 time. Uh, the overall cohort showed relatively normal T1 times as compared to uh, historical controls. With respect to post-gadolinium T1 time, again, um, sex predicted that parameter. Uh, and then something that we want to look into more, the, which site they were at also seemed to predict post-gadolinium T1 time. Uh, and that's important uh, for us to investigate further. It didn't seem like that was only based on the age, because age was actually not a significant predictor of this parameter. Now the partition coefficients, again, were also relatively normal in the overall cohort, but again, GA triplet repeat length, both in adults and children, predicted uh, this, this parameter. And then in the children also, uh, sex predicted uh, partition coefficient. And then finally, the extracellular volume was also predicted by GA triplet repeat length. Uh, again, in the overall cohort, the numbers were not uh, exceedingly abnormal, uh, but we could see um, a correlation with that uh, genetic severity parameter. So how did uh, the T1 parameters uh, interact with the L left ventricular structural var variables? So the left ventricular mass index and the left ventricular mass volume ratio. 
when we took a quick look, we thought, oh, look at that. They do correlate when you look uh, at native T1 time, for example, and, and left ventricular mass and left ventricular mass volume ratio. But when we did a deeper dive and corrected for sex and age and GA triple repeat length, this was not a significant correlation. So in conclusion, T1 mapping provides information about the LV myocardium and Friedrich ataxia, which appears to be independent of the presence of left ventricular remodeling and hypertrophy. So these structural changes that we can detect in about half of our patients aren't the, aren't the only things that will predict what the T1 mapping variables show us. Of course, now we need information about the natural history of how these T1, map T1 mapping variables um, evolve over time, and also we need to look, more importantly, at the relationship of these T1 variables to um, meaningful cardiac outcomes. Again, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, both in the U.S. and especially in Melbourne, uh, especially Roger Peverell, who couldn't be here today, who's put together a lot of this da data. And then also I want to acknowledge Farah and specifically the Branya J. Keats Award for International Collaboration and Research in FA, trying to do a, a single cardiac MRI and biomarker protocol a, a, across the pond, or across the bigger pond, um, is something that we didn't know for sure at first whether it was feasible, and we're really excited to be able to look at all of this data that we're getting back. And of course, thank you to the study participants who laid still for us for over an hour on a table, uh, gave us lots of blood and lots of their time. Thank you.